I once was lost. I once was lost. Can you say that? Do you believe that? Do you know what? That is every true Christian's testimony. That's our story. We believe that we were lost. Do you believe that until you repent of your sin and until you come to Christ putting your trust only in what He did on the cross for sinners, that you're lost? that you will face a lost eternity even? Do you believe that unless people hear this good news about forgiveness and about repentance through Christ's death, do you believe that unless they hear that, they are lost? Do you believe that unless someone actually comes in response to that message, and believingly repents and is born again, they are lost. That's actually what the Bible teaches, isn't it? Do you believe now that, then that you are found as a Christian? Do you, do you know that you've, you've had your sins forgiven, paid for, by the death of Christ upon that cross? Do you know now that you have actually been born again? That you've been made new in Christ and that you've come into the possession of eternal life? That would be quite good news, wouldn't it? Do you know then, if that's true of you, that you're just a step away from heaven? David said there is but a, a step between me and death. But death for a Christian is straight into heaven. Actually, it's believing these, you would say, basic truths of the Bible that motivates Christians to work for God, doesn't it? 1 Corinthians 15, 58, I read it to you earlier, Paul sums it all up at the end of, the cha- end of chapter 15 when in, in verse 58 he tells Christians, therefore, my beloved brothers, therefore, since in chapter 15, since the gospel is true and heaven is ahead, since the sting of death is overcome by Christ's death, therefore, says Paul, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Not in vain. Because you know it's not in vain. All this labor, all this toil to the point of exhaustion, because you know it's not in vain, you should be, says Paul, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Well, I guess the question for every Christian in the room is, are you? Are you always abounding in the work of the Lord? Are you doing the work of God? Do you actually know what God has for you to do? Can you get up in the morning tomorrow and say, into the day? I'm going, to, I'm going to labor for God today. Do you know what that would look like? Do you know what you would be engaged in to be working for God? You're supposed to be. If you're wondering what exactly I'm talking about, I think Jesus probably summed it up best in, in uh, the words, whoever is not with me is against me. And... Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus expects all his followers to be actively engaged in gathering with him. That would be being with Jesus, on his side, on his mission, on his team, you could say. So are you gathering with Jesus? Do you get up in the morning and and look at the day ahead, you look at your week ahead, your month ahead, your year ahead, and say, 
I'm going to be doing the work of God this day, this week, this month, this year, and I am going to be gathering with Jesus. The Son of Man, so Jesus came to seek and to save who? That which was lost. Lost. Do you believe that the world is lost? And are you on mission joining with our Savior in seeking and saving that which is lost, gathering with Him. Well, um, I'm asking you, are you abounding in that work for the Lord? It is a work that we're all supposed to be abounding with in. Turn in your Bibles, please. Find your way in your phones or your tablets or your minds if you've got it memorized to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and we'll just read a few verses again in a a few moments, but I'd like you to have it open. There's a scene um, in a movie, I don't often mention movies from the pulpit, but there's a scene in a movie that I find very moving. It's at the end of the film called Schindler's List. I think you'd find it difficult to watch and not be moved. Schindler's Schindler's List is a Steven Spielberg movie about a man called Oscar Schindler, and he was a businessman in uh, Nazi Germany. He was a Nazi, and shortly after the Second World War began, he, he began to use the Polish Jews from the ghetto in Krakow as workers in the factory that he owned factory making pots and pans, and um, to begin with, he just used these Jewish, Jewish workers as uh, a, a way to get rich, and he got very rich doing it. Um, but as the war went on, Oscar Schindler saw many uh, atrocities being committed against the Jews by his own people, and he began to want to do them good. He began to use the money that he had accumulated to bribe officials in the Nazi regime to allow him to have more and more Jewish workers in his factory. And by the end of the war, he had therefore rescued about 1,200 Jews, or so the story goes. And there's a very touching scene at the end of that movie, a scene I, I can never forget. Um, the Jews are gathered round to thank him. It's the end of the war, and he's going off, obviously, as a, 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 a member of the Nazi regime himself to, to face the judgment of the Allied victors, and with him are going a lot of letters from the Jews who he had rescued, saying he saved our lives, and they're thanking him, and they're giving him a present, and they're saying goodbye, and he's looking around at all the people whose lives he's saved, and they're so full of thanks, but he is so overwhelmed with regret. As they're thanking him, he's looking at his car and he's saying, if only I, he said, I I could have done more. And he starts to weep. And he said, this car, why did I need the car? Why did I keep the car? That's 10 people I could have bought. And then he looks at a pin on his suit lapel. And he says, this is gold. This is two people, this is four four people, at least two people. It's gold. Why did I keep the pin? I could have done more, said Oscar Schindler. Well, do you want to do the work of God? Do you want to? Is that your heart? I know it is for so many of you. 
When you look back at the last year of your life, do you look at the opportunities you had to do the work of God and like Oscar Schindler, bow your head in grief and think, I could have done more. I should have done more. Oh, that I I had done more. I think that's how the Corinthians must have been feeling after they got to the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when they sat in the pew and heard it read to them. The gospel is true. Christ rose from the dead. Heaven is ahead for us. New bodies, a new life, guaranteed. Reward is coming, O Christian. Therefore, says Paul, the sting of death is gone, Christian. Therefore, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. The reward is coming. I bet those Christians were squirming a little bit. They'd been fighting. They'd been busy. They'd had their sinful mess and their squabbles, and their proud disputes. And now I bet they were looking back in regret and also looking forwards with this wonder, how, how, how do we do this? I mean, we tried last year. How do we, how do, we do the work of God better? How do we do it more? How do we do it more efficiently? How do we get to the point where we're, 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 we're ready to, to, to kind of maximize the, the opportunity that we have to do everything that we can do for God? How do we get there? There must have been the frustration for them, and I think there's a, a frustration for many of us, isn't there? So much of our time and energies and resources are lost themselves because we fail. We fail to plan properly. I think actually it's that it's common, and it's a common problem for Christians in general when we hear a verse like 1 Corinthians 15 58 exhorting us to be abounding in this work. It's common for us to look back and to to think we could have done more, but just how, how could we have done more? The, the need is everywhere, isn't it? You look forwards and you say, I, I see need everywhere. But I've tried and, and, and I seem to fail at this issue of, of making the most of what I have for God to meet the need. How do you properly plan your work for God? How... How do you prioritize well? How do you know whether to respond to one opportunity or not and to take another one? What about your own desires in the whole matter and what you want to do and is that right or wrong? And, and how, how do we deal with the fact that sometimes it doesn't work out the way we wanted it to when we do plan and try to do something? And what about in all of this, the will of God? in our attempts to do things for God? How do we know what is God's will for us? And how do we know what God wants us to be doing? Well, I'm sure, like me, when it comes to working for God, you have lots of questions like that. Wouldn't it be good just to be able to kind of go back to Paul and sit down with Paul and say, Paul, okay, how did you do it? I mean, you look at the life of Paul, and how, he, how much he accomplished for the Lord. And, and wouldn't it be good to, to get him on, 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 on the platform here and to say, Paul, tell us, how do you plan your work for God? How do you go about doing this? Well, we, we can't have Paul, but thankfully, praise God, we do have these verses that he wrote telling the Corinthians about his plans for his work. And as we study these verses, well, I'm going to say, again, we get to see the principles that he operated on. 
And this time it's not principles for giving, it's principles concerned with the work of God. And so I'm calling this series Working for God. He's talking about in this section doing the work of God. Have a quick look down at 1 Corinthians 16 verse 8. In, in, in 1558 that I read, he says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. In, in 16 verse 8, he says, I'm going to stay in Ephesus until Pentecost for a wide, and effect, a wide door of effective work has opened to me. Then in verse 10, he speaks about Timothy as someone who is, and I quote, doing the work of the Lord. Now that is the exact phrase that we had in verse 58 in chapter 15. He goes on to say that Timothy is doing the work of the Lord, as am I, says Paul. And in verse 15, you can see he talks about the household of Stephanus, who had devoted themselves, devoted themselves to the service of the saints. And you would say that was the work of the Lord as well, wouldn't you? And then he says in verse 16 that we are to be subject to, to such as these, such people as the household of Stephanus, and, he says, to every fellow worker, there's our same word, worker and laborer. Now, you get the picture that the theme in these verses, as the chapter draws, as, as the book draws to a close, the theme is the same. He's still pulling out his, his exhortation to them to be always abounding in the work of the Lord. And in, as, he's, as he's unfolding that, he's telling them his plans. Yes, he's telling them his travel plans, as it says, as the cross-heading in the ESV, plans for travel. Yes, he's telling them the final instructions. But he's, as he's doing so, he's also giving them some example of what it's like to be doing the work of the Lord and some people to model themselves on. And then some exhortation as, as the chapter draws to a close, exhortation after exhortation to get themselves ready, prepared in their hearts to be able to do the work of God. And so that's why I've given this mini-series that we're starting today, the title, Working for God. In verses 5 to 12, we're going to try and pick out um, the principles for planning our work for God. Planning your work for God is what I'm calling this first part. And then in verses 13 24, we're going to hear his exhortation to help us prepare our hearts for working for God. So that's the little uh, heads up as to where we're going. Today we're just going to get started looking at how Paul planned his work for God and begin to derive some of the principles from it. I think we can discern five principles for planning our work for God in this passage. I'm hoping you've all got one of the service sheets. Did they uh, get printed and handed out? Did nobody hand them out? Did they not print? All right. Um, I sent them to the printer, but whether they ever emerged from, emerged from it, that could be a paper problem or a um, it could be just that they're sitting there in a big pile. Well, I'm hoping that you've all got those in front of you now. <laughs> uh, that's Bob Hope and No Hope. <laughs> so, uh, without that in front of you, we'll carry on. I, I think we can discern five, five principles in verses 5 to 12 for planning our work for God. You want to plan your work for God in the year ahead? Five principles are in this text. We're just going to do the first one today, and we'll do the, the next four next time. But let's read the text, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 5 to 12. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, says Paul, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, 
for a wide door of effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, see that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord, as am I. So let no one despise him. Help him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brothers. Now, concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. Well, today I want to point out to you something really basic by way of drawing out the first principle of planning from this text. And the first principle of planning we can see Paul operating on in this text is that Paul planned his strategy, he planned his work for God according to strategy. Number one, the first principle, if you're taking notes, he planned We should plan our work for God according to strategy. And we'll draw out four others next week. But strategy, you say, where's the strategy? Well, it's here, actually. He was was aiming at the maximum impact for his work for God. And that aim impacted his plans. He was going to stay in Ephesus, he says, until Pentecost. And then, if you trace backwards, he was going to pass through Macedonia, pass through it, not stay there for any substantial length of time, but pass through it because he wanted to come to Corinth and spend some time with them. He didn't want to see them just in passing, he says in in verse 7. I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. And, and all of that is worked out according to, you would say, Paul's basic strategy. What's a strategy? A dictionary definition of a strategy is, and I quote, a plan of action desi- designed to achieve a long-term overall aim. This is the master plan. This is the game plan. It's not just decisions being made according to the needs of the moment. This is plans made, you would say, with an end in mind. And and, and my point is that it's clear that Paul was making his plans in this uh, section according to an overall strategy, an overall plan. He had made an assessment of the needs and importance of each area on his missionary agenda. Paul had on his missionary agenda, let's just take the the few that are mentioned here. He had Ephesus, he had the churches in Macedonia, and he had Corinth. There were others, but let's just take those three. He had made an assessment of the needs in each place, and he'd said, I have to stay here in in Ephesus. I'm going to come to you in Corinth, um, but I will pass through Macedonia. The word that's translated pass through is a word that indicates he would be passing through, not stopping. doesn't mean he wouldn't stop for a few days, but it it wasn't going to be a long stay. It was going to be passing through. But when he came to Corinth, it was going to be a long stay. He hoped it would be a long stay. He was planning for it to be a long stay. Why? Well, because he'd made an assessment of the needs, and he planned out what he thought he ought to be doing. That's called strategy. Um, That's pretty basic, isn't it? What I'm saying is that Paul, you would say, he saw the strategic importance in the grand scheme of things of spending time with the Corinthians. Let's boil it down to that. And, and, and so he was working out his plan according to this strategy that was the master plan behind his plan. Actually, you can study the work of Paul through the missionary labors of Paul through the book of Acts and his letters and realize that he had a very clear strategy that he worked towards in, in general all the time. Henry Morris the creation scientist and scholar 
um, writes that this, he especially concentrated, and I quote, he especially concentrated on great cities, particularly the major seaports. He had come from the large city of Tarsus himself, and he preached in the great capital, Rome, and in Athens, uh, the world's cultural center. Philippi was the, quote, chief city of Macedonia in Acts 16.12, as was Corinth in Achaia. I've mentioned to you before, Corinth was the capital of the Roman province, Achaia, that's the kind of northern part of Greece. The uh, um, Sorry, the, the, yeah, the, the northern part of the, the, the Peloponnesian Peninsula, uh, it, it, the, the Peloponnesian part of Greece. Now, um, Corinth, that was the capital of that province. Ephesus in, was the major city, Morris writes, in Asia Minor. Antioch, Troas, Thessalonica were all great seaport cities. Morris continues, establishing solid churches in such cities would provide centers for carrying the gospel throughout the world. Now, you can look that up and see how it happened. You look, about, you look at the church in Ephesus, and you can see how the gospel, Paul went to Ephesus, but then Paul writes that the gospel went from there throughout Asia. And it was, that was, the, you would say, the strategy that he followed. He would take the gospel message and plant churches in the major cities and from those major centers of influence, the gospel would spread because people would carry it to the regions beyond. He even writes to the Corinthians and talks about his desire to go to the regions beyond them, to have them help him on his way to the the regions beyond. Now, you can look up all the cities that Paul visited as uh, Robert Bradshaw has done, and, I, and, and see just how significant they were. I'll, I'll quote him. Antioch in Pisidia, Lystra, Troas, Philippi, and Thessalonica were all Roman colonies, and therefore were connected by Roman roads. Paphos, Thessalonica, Athens, and Corinth were the capital cities of Cyprus, Macedonia, Attica, and Achaia, respectively, and therefore were centers of Roman administration. The others were either ports, Salamis, Paphos, Italia, Perga, Troas, Neapolis, Ephesus, and Centria, all, all connected, he says, all connected by major land routes. Obviously, all the ports, he says, would also lie on major land routes. The only exception to this general rule, and that's quite significant, isn't it? The, the only exception to this general rule, he says, is Berea, which lay off the beaten track. But, however, it was one of the most popular cities of Macedonia. And that's just by, he's done that research by going through all the encyclopedia entries for those cities, for which I'm very grateful because I ran out of time to do it. Um, So, what do we say? Paul's missionary strategy. The point is very simple. Right now, he says, I'm facing an open door in Ephesus. He's writing 1 Corinthians from Ephesus. He's there, there's an open door for effective labor, effective work. But he's thinking, or in the middle of his work, he's thinking ahead, he's planning ahead for the work that he wants to accomplish in the future, and he's, he's planning that future work according to a strategy that rates... Now get this, it rates the relative importance of any work in any place. The potential impact of spending more time and effort in one place compared to another. Well, what do you call that? You call it strategy. By the way, the significance of Corinth in Paul's mind, is huge. And we've started this wonderful exposition a few years ago through the book of 1 Corinthians. And some people have asked me, are you going to go on straight into 2 Corinthians? I'm so tempted, but I, 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 I'm not. But if you add together 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, 
You have 29 chapters written to one church. That's the biggest book in the New Testament. That's bigger than any of the Gospels. That's bigger than Acts. All written to one church, and we actually know that Paul wrote several other letters to Corinth. This church, the hellhole church in the city of Sodom, in first century Roman province of Achaia, called Cor- the, the city called Corinth, this hellhole church was deserving, the hellhole city rather, with a, a church in a mess. <laughs> you could almost call it a hellhole church, but it was a church in a mess in a hellhole city. This church, in Paul's mind, figured large, and he was willing to give it attention and resources and time and energy. That's strategy. So, what do we make of a strategy like this? Well, very briefly, I want to point out three lessons that we should learn from Paul's strategy so that we can learn to strategize in our own work for God. And also, happily, to join in the strategies of others. So, three lessons about strategy. Number one, strategy is not sinful. It's not wrong to have a master plan. It's not, it's not sinful to strategize. That's obvious from the fact that Paul did so, but also you'd say, Um, It's obvious from the fact that Jesus did that. Do you remember Jesus? There was a time in his ministry when he went from town to town. Then you get to this in Luke chapter 11. He set his face towards Jerusalem. and, And that meant bypassing certain other potential ministry destinations. There was a time when he dotted about Galilee And he went from city to city, from town to town, from village to village. And then there was a time when in the mind of Christ, the destination had to be Jerusalem. Actually, on his route to Jerusalem, the the fact that he was going to Jerusalem precluded him from spending time in some Samaritan cities because they wouldn't wouldn't have him because his, his face was set towards Jerusalem. It was not only his... It was not only his secret strategy, it was his public strategy. We're going to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is now the mission for Jesus. And so we'd say strategy is not sinful. Okay? Um, I told you this would be brief. That's easy, isn't it? So why is it then? Come on. Let's be... We're in church, let's be honest. Uh, Why is it that some of us find the idea of making any kind of strategy about the things of God somehow awkward? What is it that causes us, I've asked this as one of the questions on the sheet that you don't have, um, for you to think about on Wednesday evening in your fellowship group discussions, What is it that makes some Christians really struggle with this idea of planning and strategizing? Where are the struggles coming from? Is there some merit in being spontaneous and unplanned, random? Have you seen Christians who behave like that? They're, they're off in this direction. And then some prompting, they're going in this direction. And, and they feel like they're like Philip, the, you know, the Ethiopian um, eunuch Philip, who was you know, kind of carried away by the Spirit. And then he, the Spirit took him here, and the Spirit took him there, and the Spirit took him everywhere. And, and you, you get people who, who almost believe that that ought to be their life, that should be the normal life of a missionary, well, they'd be very disappointed with the Apostle Paul, because the Apostle Paul's sitting down with a map and saying, you know, I'm planning on going here, and I'm planning on going here, and then I'm going to bypass, I'm just going to stop over here and here, I'm going to bypass these places, but I'm heading here, and I'm going to spend time here. 
Why? Because that's valuable, because I've considered it, because I've evaluated it. But some people just want to just drift and respond to whatever impulses they have and feel like somehow that's more spiritual. Well, is it? I'm going to say unplanned is not more spiritual. Strategy is not unspiritual. Strategy is not sinful. So, uh, I think we dealt with that, have we? Number one, strategy is not sinful. Number two, I told you they'd be brief. Strategy is wisdom applied to the work of God. Strategy is wisdom applied to the work of God. Who says that we should not do the work of God according to wisdom? You watch them. They will struggle more than usual. If the axe is dull and he does not sharpen its edge, then he must exert more strength. Wisdom has the advantage of giving success. So said Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10. You can remember that? Ecclesiastes 10, 10. The sharp axe. You don't sharpen your axe. If the iron is not sharp, as the ESV puts it, you have to exert more strength. Why would you take a blunt axe and spend 10 days trying to chop down the tree with all the blisters and all the sore, aching joints involved in that shaking as your blunt axe bounces again and again off the tree when you could spend a quarter of a day sharpening it and, sharpening it and chop it down in half a day? Why? Would you do that? Was it wisdom, says Solomon, has the advantage of giving success? And I'm saying that just that, that, that planning, strategizing is just wisdom apply, strategizing is wisdom applied to planning. You're taking a master plan and you're applying it to your short-term plan. How many of you have a master plan? Let's, I'm not asking you to put your hand up. But let's just look forwards for a moment. What are you going to be doing this week? You've seen, perhaps, as I've seen, those um, very expensive things being advertised on Facebook. You know, you can buy a sheet of paper with a plan on it for like 20 pounds. Uh, it's got a pre-drawn plan, you know, what it's going to get you to do is write down on, on Monday, it's going to get you to, to write down a list of things that you want to accomplish this week. And then, you know what it gets you to do next? It's going to get you to go through and evaluate them in terms of the, the, the importance of each of those items. It's going to say, you know, give it a one if it's not very important, give it a 10 if it's very important. And you go through and you put a a number by that. And then you, and then you go through, the next column is you go through and you, you're going to put, choose which day you're going to do it. And so at the beginning of your week, you're going to say what I want to achieve this week, and then you're going to have a look at your week, and you're going to say, when am I going to achieve it? And how important are these things? And which order am I going to do them in? And maybe I'll have to leave some of them, and maybe I'll have to focus on others. And, and should we ask for a show of hands about how many of you ever do that? How many of you ever look ahead and prioritize and plan and, and evaluate the significance of what you've got to do in one week? What about one month? What about this year? We, we have arrived at the end of January. Do you know what you wish to accomplish this year for God? All right, forget work for a moment. But what about God? What is your work for God? Oh, we go back, we're going to go back to the beginning. It's, it's whoever does not gather with me scatters, right? Are you going to be gathering or scattering for Jesus this year? One or the two. You're either gathering or you're scattering, but gathering takes organization, doesn't it? You've got to know where you're going to go, who you're going to speak to, when you're going to speak to them, what you're going to give up in order to speak to them. 
uh, it's called planning. Are you planning your evangelism? Some people would, would think that we were going all pragmatic if I said to you, why don't you go home and write down a list of all the unbelievers that you know and, and, and decide when you're going to speak to them and how you're going to try to communicate the gospel to them and make a plan and, and pray over it. And that would be kind of, that would be what the pragmatic churches do. Do you know what? They see a lot more conversions than the super spiritual. We believe in the sovereignty of God. God will somehow make it all happen and we'll just kind of drift people. Why? Because these people over here who, who maybe don't have such a firm grasp on the sovereignty of God at least see their need to plan. But I've said it before that planning is not sinful. Planning, I'm just going to say it again now, number two, planning is just God's wisdom applied, sorry, strategy is not sinful, strategy is just God's wisdom applied to planning, all right? So strategy is just saying, okay, here's what I need to, to accomplish, and this is what I think is the best, the most wise, the most um, effective way I can accomplish it. Paul looked at the world, <laughs> Aren't you grateful that someone looks at the world and says, how do we reach the world with the gospel? Paul did that. And he said, I need to go to these cities. I need to plant churches in these cities. And then the gospel will spread around the world. But do you, do you get the principle? He strategized. And he just applied wisdom to it. I mean, it's just basic wisdom, isn't it? The biggest cities... The most people, the more people, the more potential for those people to form a strong congregation. Strong congregations are ones that can send people out, <laughs> and then more work gets done. More, more cities get evangelized, and it just goes on and on and on. I mean, it's really basic, but it's really wise. Now, turn with me back to... Um, Proverbs chapter 15. I want to nail this for you just in case there's some of you who think as I used to think many years ago. Uh, I was wrestling greatly with this issue of planning and the will of God. Some people told me it was God's will for me to do this, and they were sure. Other people told me it was God's will for me to do that. And they were sure. And I was stuck in the middle. I didn't know what it was God's will for me to do. And I was sure. <laughs> so, what did I do? What did we do? I faced a decision. Do I start this course of study that would take me 10 years Donna and I went on holiday and we said, you know what, we need wisdom. We desperately need wisdom. And so in our two-week holiday on the Ile de Groix, off the coast of Brittany, we took the Bible with us. Remarkable book, the Bible. There's a book in it called Proverbs, and it's wisdom. Just wisdom on every page. And as we read through the book of Proverbs, you know, we didn't know much, but we came away with this. Proverbs 15.22, without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors they succeed. Oh, then there's Proverbs 16, verse 1, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Verse 3, commit your work to the Lord and, oh, whose plans? What does it say? Your plans will be what? Established. Hold on a minute. God expects you to plan. Yes, God has a will for your life. Yes, God has a plan for your life. But do you know what? He didn't tell you, did he? And you don't find it written between the lines in the Bible. 
You can't do, as one person said to me to do when I was faced with these anguished choices, look for a word in the Bible. And, and when you read a word in the Bible and it says, go on up, and that is kind of somehow impressed strongly upon your soul, you can feel as though God has spoken to you and you can know that God is telling you to go on up, bald head. <laughs> He's not looking at me. That would be wrenching that, that, that verse out of Scripture, wouldn't it? Maybe for Adam. <laughs> he, would, he would feel that it applied personally to him. But it would still be wrenching the verse from Scripture, wouldn't it? Because in, in context, it's an insult given by some young men to a prophet. And it's not a command to you to go on up anywhere. And the people that follow that approach to the Bible open the Bible at random and find these verses. And you know the story about the man who was feeling suicidal and he opened the Bible and, 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 and it, it, he turned to the page where it said, and, and he went away and hung himself. He's like, you know. And then he opened the, closed the Bible quickly, opened it up again, and it said, do what you have to do and do it quickly. You know, I'm just like, <laughs> that's, that's not a safe way to use the Bible. But the Bible expects you to plan. God expects you to plan. But He expects you to seek wise counsel for those plans. He expects you to know that the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the mouth is from the Lord. You know that God is the one who ultimately holds your future. But so, so you're supposed to commit your plans to the Lord. And, and so what, what do you learn from all of that? And other, many other verses in in, in Proverbs, we won't turn to, but wonderful book for wisdom. All, what we learn is very simple. Planning, strategizing, is just wisdom applied to planning, right? Looking ahead and making a plan. Do you know what? I'm going to spend the first quarter of the day sharpening my axe, and then the second two quarters of the day the next two quarters of the day, cutting down the tree. There's order. There's wisdom applied to your future plans. It's so simple. I'm going to visit these cities first, and then those cities, but not these cities, because if I, if I bypass that one and go to this one, the gospel will spread more and will spread more widely, and the work will go on without me. I can do more in less time. That's wisdom applied to planning. That's strategy. All right, number three, strategy is the stuff of leadership. Strategy is the stuff of leadership. So simple, isn't it? It's really obvious that the people who can plan and strategize well naturally are, in any group, the leaders or at least involved in leadership, if you can't strategize well, if you're not looking forwards into the future and thinking about the needs ahead, if you're not, as someone said of the Apostle Paul, looking over every mountain range and wanting to reach the people beyond, if you're not looking at every, at every ocean and thinking about the needs of those beyond, unless someone is doing that, unless someone is saying, we should, this, this is needed, it's not going to happen. So, so you say that kind of strategizing, when it's done well, is the stuff of leadership. But you need to lead yourself, don't you? You've got, a, at, least a, you've got at, least, you've got at least a follower of one. Wherever your mind tells you to go, you should go. Whatever your mind tells you is the best thing to do, you should do. You can't have someone else telling you what to do with every moment of every day, so you have to look at your day and decide, what am I going to do today? But the, least, the less able you are to strategize and to plan in that way, the less able you are to lead. The more able you are to strategize and to plan in that way, the more able you are to give leadership to others to say to them, we think that this is the best thing that we should be doing. And so I say strategy is the stuff of leadership. 
And I think it's part of God's spiritual gifting if you just turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And the second list of, of gifts given there, it in, begins in verse 28. It says, God, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Right, helping and administrating. Let's just take those two for a moment. Helping, well, that's when you come alongside someone and help them with what they're doing and whatever they're doing. Administrating, well, administrating is actually kind of a leadership, isn't it? I mean, you, you may be you may be maybe even carrying out someone else's plan, but you're giving order and leadership and direction and priority to a whole load of things that would otherwise be, be missed. And so I, I believe the gift of administration is, is, is necessary in, in the, to, to a certain degree in this, this gift that you might say, I said when we went through all the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and I compared them to Romans 12 and 1 Peter 5, um, uh, there's, there's those three areas that kind of draw out little bits of information on the gifts. The lists of gifts don't match exactly. They don't, there's overlap, but there's lap at the end. And, and because of that, we say they're not, then it's not an exhaustive list in any one place. And that gives you the impression that there are more gifts than there are listed and, and, and so you could say the gift of strategy would be um, a spiritual gift. I, I, I'm just putting that forward. I think you could say the gift of encouragement might be a spiritual gift. Similarly, but it's not listed in Scripture as a, as a particular spiritual gift. But you can see that kind of blessing happening in a, in a, a body of Christ when someone is gifted with a gift of encouragement. And they just, they, they just encourage people wherever they go. <clears throat> well, what do we say to all of this? I, I say strategy is the stuff of leadership. In order for someone to be able to give leadership to a group, you've got to be able to tell that group where they're going. If you're going to tell that group where they're going well, if you're going to commit them to what they need to do next, you need to strategize. They're all looking at you, you have to come up with a strategy. You have to give it to them. That's leadership. If you don't give it to them, guess what happens? If there's no one else that stands up and gives leadership, the whole group just stagnates. It's not the case that if you get a group of people and give no, no leadership to them, they just organically, kind of magically go in the direction that they're supposed to go. No, God is, God's gift um, to the church, at least, is leadership. And I think God's gift to the world in terms of common grace is the gift of leadership. And in any structure in society, with, when there's no gifted leaders present, the, the whole body of people fails to progress. And, and that's, a, that's a shame and a, a national humiliation, you might say, when we don't have that kind of leadership at a national level. But all that, by the way... Strategy is the stuff of leadership. That's my third point. So, how are you doing? If you're looking at the year ahead, who are you leading? Well, you're leading yourself, so are you strategizing? But do you have someone else to lead? What about your family? Are you making a strategy, fathers, husbands, are you making a strategy as the leader in your home for how you as a family, as a home, are going to do the work of God in the year ahead? If you don't, maybe your wife is like, please, someone just tell me what to do. I just want to work for the Lord. But you know what? You get up on a Saturday morning and you're like, Ah, oh, what are we going to do today? And your wife's like, oh, another weekend lost for the work of the Lord. Another evening lost. Another week lost. Another month lost. 
another year lost. And at the end of your life, are you going to be like Oskar Schindler? Looking at all the people who are lost and saying, I could have done more. Ministry team leaders at Grace Life London. We met yesterday. We had such a wonderful time. So, such a blessing to listen to them all, telling us about what the last year was like, giving us their prayer needs for the year ahead and then praying together. So encouraging to us as pastors to see all that the Lord has done and all that the Lord has put on their hearts for the year ahead for them to do. But ministry leaders at Grace Life London, let me speak directly to you. You are leading. You're leading your team. Are you going to strategize to do the work of God in the year ahead with your team and give that leadership that's needed? It's not sinful. It's just wisdom applied to planning. And it is the stuff of leadership. Well, may the Lord help you whether you're leading in a ministry team at church, whether you're leading at work, whether you're leading in the home, whether you're leading just your own life, wherever you are leading, may you lead with the wisdom applied to your planning that is strategy. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray and um, ask you, living God, to... Help us individually, corporately. Help us, please, to do the work of God. To labor to see lost souls saved. To labor to see more saved. To labor to see your saints built up. To serve the saints. Help us, Lord, to strategize in this work, to plan it well, to organize it so that we can do more, to do it better, to do it so that there's a greater impact. And we ask you that that would be the case for your glory, for the sake of your holy name. Amen.